So let me start over here in uh, Proverbs chapter 29. I would imagine that Dwayne's also going to be using these verses. That's the reason I go first is so I can, I can do this and then he has to adjust. No, it's really good. Matter of fact, we actually, I think it was the last conference that we actually took the same scriptures and taught on the same things. And so I, I taught on things and then he came along and straightened it all out and fixed it <laughs> afterwards. But in uh, Proverbs chapter 29 and in verse 18, it says, where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. And Dwayne even referred to this real briefly just when he was up here a while ago. But vision is such an important part of the Christian life. And most people honestly don't have a vision for their life. I mean, their vision is just to kind of go with the flow and whatever happens in their life, they try and just maintain it and, uh, you know, do the best that they can. But they don't have a real clear purpose for their life. And the scripture says here that if you don't have a vision, you perish. You know, one of the other translations, uh, I think it's the American Standard Version, says that where there is no vision, the people cast off restraint. And what that's a picture of is, see that if you have a vision, if you've got some place that you're going, then that limits your options. It limits what you're going to do because after all, in order to get to that place, you've got to do certain things. It's like if you wanted to get from here to New York, you couldn't just go out here and take any road because you would have to be headed in the right direction. You'd be head, have to be headed northeast and you'd have to look and choose the roads that would take you there. But if you have no place in mind, you can go out and take any old road and it'll get you there. So you need to have a vision, a purpose for your life because what that will do is dictate to you how you act the things that you do. And people that don't have a vision, they don't have any restraint on themselves. They're just maintaining. And I tell you, that's, vision is one of the important things in life. You know, when we started building all of this campus right here, I had a vision for all of this and I was really excited. And then we got into a situation, I won't go into the details, but we had to uh, build our parking garage. I'd already started doing things in good faith. There was a company that was going to build it for us and just let us lease it, which would have been a tremendous uh, benefit to me. I wouldn't have had to put out that money. And so we had already spent $6 million getting things ready for this deal. And then it fell through. And so I had to come up with $6 million by the end of the week, <laughs> which I didn't have $6 million. And so we took out a loan on this thing and I'm determined to do things debt free. And so when we did that, I basically just had to wait until we got that paid off. And we paid off $28 million in, what was it, 19 months? So we paid off $28 million. But anyway, during that 18 months, while we were paying this off, I just put my vision on hold because I wasn't going to build anything else or do anything else until we got that paid off. And I can tell you that was not an enjoyable time. Although I still loved God and still praised God and I knew that eventually we'd get things going, I just, it, it does something to me to have a vision. Like we had a meeting today where we were looking at a building and it's gonna be at least $150 million. And you know what? I spent all afternoon just thinking about that and I just love the adrenaline rush of having to come up with $150 million and we're doing everything debt free. And I just, I like it. it. It winds me up. I love having a vision. It makes me focus on things. And if you don't have a purpose for your life, if you're just getting up and going to work and coming home and you're just maintaining and you're, the extent of your vision is just to you know, keep the food on the table and maybe have something to retire with, but you don't have a real purpose for your life. I tell you, you're missing out on some of the really best part of life. When you get up in the morning, you know that God's got a purpose for your life. You aren't a mistake. You were created with the purpose and it just gives you an incentive to, to live and to do things that so many people don't have. And I think this is why people, they, they just get bored. They spend so much time in entertainment 
and doing other things. Um, you know, I'm not critical of anybody else. Please don't take what I'm saying wrong, but people just do games and, and they just waste time and do stuff. Man, if you've got a vision, you just hadn't got time to be goofing off. Each one of us have an expiration date. This isn't a dress rehearsal. You're burning daylight. And every day you need to be moving towards something that God has shown you. And very, very few people have that. This is a vision conference. And I'm assuming that people probably came here because we advertised it as a vision conference. And yet out of this, there's maybe 10%, maybe 15% that have a clear vision. The others are looking for a vision. So... I believe that God is gonna help you to find that. So I'm gonna be talking about uh, multiple things. Uh, let me just say, first of all, that this little booklet on 10 godly leadership essentials, uh, vision is one of these 10 things that I've got in here, but it's number five in this list. And the reason for that is because I believe that vision comes out of relationship with God. You don't start with vision. And so many people are trying to come up with God. What's the vision for my life? You know, God's real vision for you, God's real purpose. The number one claim on your life is to be a living sacrifice. And that's what that book that Carrie was talking about, how to find, follow, and fulfill God's will. That's what that's all about. The way that God got me started on this was I got born again when I was eight, but when I was 18, I had been seeking the Lord to know what he wanted me to do with my life. And in college, I was a math major just because that was my best subject, but I didn't have a clue what I was supposed to do. And I was really seeking the Lord and asking him what my purpose was. And he showed me out of Romans chapter 12, verse one, it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Man, there's a lot in that verse. But let me just say that it's the mercy of God that he was beseeching us by. Not because God is a harsh God and he's gonna punish you if you don't do this, but God's plans for you are better than your plans for yourself. And so it's to your own advantage. By the mercies of God, you need to find out God's purpose for your life because I can guarantee you it's better than your plans for yourself. There's not a single person in here that your plans for yourself are as good as God's plans for you. Now, hopefully you, you, your plans ha have reconciled with God's plans. They've matched. But if you don't know for sure what God's plan is, then I can guarantee you whatever you're doing is not as good as what God has planned for you. Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. The NIV says a hope in a future. And you know, I, I like the hope in the future and that's great, but I really like the expected end because so many people just don't know what the future's about. You know, Melissa was singing that song about don't be afraid when you walk through the darkest night that he'll be your light, he'll be your guide. And some people don't have the assurance that if they really commit themselves to the Lord, how things are gonna work out. But that Jeremiah 29, 11, when you understand God's plans for you, it's to give you an expected end. You don't have to wonder, am I gonna wind up seeing Isla in my old days? Am I gonna have dementia? Am I gonna be sick? If you would find God's will, God's will is not for any single person to go through those things. And if you would conform to it, you can have an expected end. I'm gonna go out with the shout, not with the whimper. Amen. 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 So God's got a plan for you.
That's what Romans 12, 1 says. And it's just your normal Christian duties, what it says. And it's to be a living sacrifice. That's really God's will for your life. And then everything else comes out of it. And again, that little booklet that I wrote, if you have a good relationship with the Lord, that will cause you to humble yourself and to put him over your life. And it won't be you trying to get him to bless you. It won't be you having a vision and saying, oh God, help me do this. But you will put God first. You will wind up just being submitted unto him and you will have a relationship with him. You'll hear his voice and then he will speak to you and give you his vision for your life. And when you have God's vision, man, it's just totally different than when you're doing your thing and asking God to bless it. I said a bunch right there. Let me turn over to Psalms chapter 39. I wanted to go to these verses and again, the song that Melissa sang, she uh, was using some of these verses. But in Psalms 139, if you read the first 12 verses of this, he's just talking about where can I go to escape from God? I can't go anywhere. I can't ascend into heaven. I can't do anything. I can't hide from God. The darkness is like light around him. And then to prove this, he says that when I was in my mother's womb, God covered me. God inhabited me while I was in my mother's womb. You know, this is a sideline, but this is a tremendous passage for children are not just a hunk of flesh that you can dispose of because it's inconvenient. They are children that are inhabited by God. When a person aborts a child, you are killing a life. God had a plan for them. And so that's what these verses are talking about. And he said in... Um, Verse 13, this is Psalms 139, verse 13. For thou hast possessed my reins, that's talking about my heart. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, when as in continuance there were none of them. Let me read that to you in the uh, NIV. Again, this is old English, but it says in verse 16, Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. This is really important that you understand this that it's not up to you to just say, God, here's what I want to do. Would you bless this? It's not good enough for you to say, God, I want to do something good with my life. And you ask God to bless that. You know, when I was in Vietnam, I remember my chaplain. I talked to him and I said, why did you become a chaplain? And this guy just said, well, I wanted to do something good. So I thought about being a doctor. I thought about being a lawyer. And then I thought about being a chaplain. And he just wanted to do something good. And so he chose that. But I said, did God call you to it? And no, he, he says, no, I just wanted to do something good. I thought this would be something good to do with my life. I'm not asking you to raise your hand on this, but I can guarantee you there's many, many, many people right here that that is exactly your take on things. You're wanting your life to count. And so you're just thinking, what can I do that's good? But did you know just because it's good doesn't mean it's God. According to these verses, you were formed and inhabited by God while you were still in your mother's womb. And it says that all of the days of your life were written in a book. Did you know God has a book on every single life here? And he wrote what every day, not just the overall purpose of your life, but every day he had something planned for you. And I believe that we're going to stand before the Lord. First Corinthians chapter three says that all of us will stand there and we will give an answer for what we've done. And some people have built with gold, silver, and precious stones. Other people have built with wood, hay, and stubble. And he's going to set a fire to our works. And if it wasn't these precious stones, then it'll be reduced to ashes. And it says, we will be saved yet so as by fire. There's, going to, there's not going to be any bad way to get into heaven. If you get into heaven, man, you're going to be thankful that you're there. 
But I do believe that some of us are going to stand before God and see our good works. Maybe it was good what you did. Maybe you did help some other people. But was it what God had written in your book? And if it isn't what God planned for your life, then it's going to be reduced to ashes. And you know, the scripture says that he's going to wipe away all tears from our eyes. But I don't believe that that's necessarily talking about us coming into heaven. And we've had so much trouble in this life that we just barely got there and we're all crying. And he's going to wipe tears from our eyes. I believe it's when we stand before the Lord. Believers are going to stand before the Lord, not for the purpose of punishment, but for the purpose of rewards and to find out whether we built with good uh, materials, gold, silver, and precious stones, our wood, hay, and stubble. And I believe that when some of us see what God's plans for our life were and what we did, I believe there's going to be some weeping and wailing of gnashing of teeth and that God is going to have to wipe tears away from our life, eyes. And so I'm saying these things to say that it's not up to you to just pick and choose and ask God to bless what you're doing. And so you're doing what everybody else is doing. You got a family and you're working and you give a tithe and you go to church and you do good things and you just hope that's enough. That's not enough. It may be enough to get into heaven. If you're born again, again, that's great. But man, God has something more for you. Did you know what he wrote in his book isn't about heaven? I believe that everything that he wrote in, in your book about what your life is supposed to be. That's for what, for this life. When you get to heaven, man, that's going to be awesome, but there's not going to be any failure there. There won't be anybody making mistakes there. What God wrote in his book for your life is for this life. And are you fulfilling what God has for your life? So I'm going to be talking more about once you understand the vision and I'm going to be talking about what God spoke to me about taking the limits off God and we're going to be dealing with all kinds of things. But first of all, you've got to know what God's will for your life is. You got to have God's vision. You aren't going to fulfill it accidentally. And I can guarantee you, Pastor Dwayne's going to be saying the same thing, but you, in my life and his life, any person who feels like that we have discovered God's will for our life and moving in that direction, you don't get there sovereignly. You don't get there accidentally. It doesn't automatically happen. God gives you a purpose, a direction. And I guarantee you between you and where God wants you to go, there is going to be opposition. If you never run into the devil, it's because you're both headed in the same direction. When you turn around and swim upstream, there is going to be resistance. And unless you know for sure that God has called you to do this, and unless you burn your bridges behind you so that you aren't just trying this, and if it works, then you'll do it. But no, you have to have a commitment and you have to be focused on it. Unless you have that kind of an attitude, you aren't going to get there. Now, if all you want to do is just maintain and be a nice person and when you die, go to heaven, you can do that in many different ways. But if you want to fulfill what God wrote in his book for you, I guarantee you are going to have to get a revelation, a God given revelation of this. And then you are going to have to pursue it. If you pursue it, you'll get it. If you don't, you won't. It does not come automatically. Man, there's been so many times that Jamie and I were tempted to give up. And the reason we didn't give up is because we knew beyond a shadow of a doubt what God called us to do. And even though nothing in our life seemed to match, there was no alternative. I wasn't just trying it. Our whole life was committed to this. And it's just kept us going. You know, hope is a powerful, powerful force. And um, it says that faith is the substance of things hoped for. Your faith gives substance to things that are hope, unseen, but yet a confident assurance, a revelation that God has given you. And if you don't have that, it, it's not going to work. Over in Hebrews chapter 6, it talks about hope being an anchor of the soul. Your soul is your mental, emotional part. And that's the part that, that gets out of whack. That's the part that gets led astray and drawn to the side. And it says that hope is an anchor for the soul that enters right into the holy place where God is. Hope will hold you on course. And again, this is exactly what's happened to Jamie and me, that we had a hope. 
We had a vision and that's what kept us from giving up when everything around us looked like we should have. It looked like we had already failed and yet we just decided to keep hoping. And I know enough about Pastor Dwayne and Sue to know that this is the same thing with them. You know, we haven't been real good friends, but except for the last 12 years or so. But I remember, how many years ago was it your church burnt down? 21 years ago. And I heard about that and I sent them a little offer and it wasn't much, but it was a lot for me back 21 years ago. And I remember... Uh, him putting out a newsletter. And I guarantee you, you could have been discouraged <laughs> when your church burnt down and yet they knew what God had called them to do. And you know, they haven't backed up. And if I'm not mistaken, you're in a 20 something million dollar building program in Duran, Oklahoma now. 30, 30, 30. It's gone up 32 million. <laughs> and then they got a building program that they're doing here and they, they've just been building for a long time. But see, it was their hope that kept them going. And yet most people see don't have that end goal and because of it, Satan is going to throw problems at you and there will be obstacles, there will be hurdles. And unless you have that hope that holds you steady, you aren't going to persevere unto the end. You can't just try this. You have to be committed to it. Amen. You know, it's like marriage. So many people try marriage. And I guarantee you, if you marry somebody, you put two different people together, there's going to be some differences. There's going to be things happening. If you're just trying it, there's a lot of people that give up. But Jamie and I, we were raised in a church that, you know, uh, uh, divorce was just not an option. Now, murder might be considered, but <laughs> they, you could be forgiven of murder, but man... Divorce was just not an option. I remember my uncle Safi telling me when we, when I took Jamie down to introduce her to some of my relatives and he says, boy, you're a Womack and Womacks don't get divorce. That was his way of saying that this isn't Sears and Roebuck. You can't bring her back if you don't like her. And so Jamie and I are committed and because of that, man, we've been married over 50 years now and it's better than it's ever been. God's blessing us. But see, there's so many people that just try it. And if it doesn't work out, they, they go a different direction. You got to be committed to the point that there is no option. You know, I was flying in a plane one time with a guy and it was a little tiny plane where my shoulder touched the window and his shoulder touched the window and they touched each other in the middle. And we got into a storm and he was a brand new pilot and didn't have instrument rating. So he had to fly below the clouds. Anyway, it's a long story, but this guy... We were, we were dropping a thousand feet at a time, just wham like this. And then he'd pull it back up and it was bad. And finally the pilot curled up in a fetal position and he says, my God, we're going to die. We're going to die. And he covered his face. And I had to fly that plane for over an hour. I flew it over Alamogordo rifle range and they came on and they called our plane number and they said, you're in restricted air place. Get out or we're going to shoot you down. And I got on there and I said, the pilot's in a fetal position. Don't shoot me down. And, and anyway, I wanted to get out, but you know what? I was committed. <laughs> I wanted to say, stop and let me out, but I didn't have a parachute. I, you couldn't just pull over on the side of the road and get out. Man, that was commitment. I had to do something. I had to fly that plane when the, while the pilot was freaking out. Somebody said, what happened? Well, of course, I died in it. You... <laughs> no, I survived, praise God, but I don't, drive, I don't fly in planes with pilots that don't know what they're doing anymore. <laughs> but you know what? You, you, when you're flying like that, you're committed. You can't just say, well, I don't like this. I quit. And you can't quit. You got to be committed. You know, let me share this with you out of um, Jeremiah chapter one. And this is a passage of scripture that in 1973, Jamie and I got married on October the 27th of 72. And uh, in January of 73, I was studying and the Lord spoke this to me. It's a long story. I won't go into the whole thing here. But in Jeremiah chapter one, 
And in verse four, it says, then the word of the Lord came unto me saying, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Now I'm aware that that was spoken to Jeremiah, but nonetheless, it says while he was still in his womb, God chose him and sanctified him, separated him to be a prophet unto the nations. And God spoke that to me and told me that. And uh, you could put that together just for time's sake. I won't turn over there. But in Galatians chapter one, the apostle Paul said, when it pleased God who separated me unto the gospel from my mother's womb. So here's two examples. Also Isaiah chapter, I believe it's chapter 44 or 45 talks about that he was separated from his womb. Every one of us, when we were still in our mother's womb, God had a purpose for your life. Now that means that it's not based on your talents and on your abilities and on your resume, what you've been able to accomplish. Matter of fact, God's purpose for your life is probably contrary to what you think you are capable of doing. For instance, I was an introvert and I couldn't even look at a person in the face and God called me to speak to billions of people every day on television. That's the exact opposite of what I thought I could do. There are many people that what they do, they pull an inventory on their life and maybe they're good in uh, administrative things or maybe they've got a musical ability or maybe they're uh, you know, physically uh, into sports or something like that. And so they look at their natural talents and abilities and think, well, maybe this is what God wants me to do. I'm not saying God can't use your natural abilities, but it's more like God chooses you to do things that are your weaknesses because that makes you dependent upon him. He will call you to call you to do something that is written in his book and what he ordained you for, but it may not be what you've developed. It may not be anywhere near what your natural talents are. You know, when we started this Bible school, I had a lady that helped us start it and she gave everybody one of these personality profile tests. And uh, I'd, I'd never heard of them at the time. And so she did it. And anyway, um, I took one of those. Matter of fact, I've taken those things three times. And it was scary how accurate those things were on me. Matter of fact, the first time I ever took one, I said, this is a setup. Somebody wrote this about me. And they just, uh, you know, put this together. And they said, nope. It... And so anyway... I believe that they do accurately show you where you are at that moment. But the reason I don't like those things is because people think this is who I am. This is what my talents are. This is what my abilities are. It, it measures where you are at that moment. It's like taking a snapshot and it'll show you where you are at that moment. But that doesn't mean that that's what God wanted you to be. That just means that's where you have developed yourself. And so when you're trying to find out what God's purpose for your life is, don't look at your abilities. You know, Dwayne and I have talked about this, but both of us aren't really candidates for what we're doing. But this goes along with what God says in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You see your calling, brother, and how that not many, would you put that up, uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 26? I don't think I can quote that without messing it up says, for you see your calling, brother, and how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, uh, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the things which are wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. And then the next verse says, the reason he did that is so that no flesh would glory in his presence. He doesn't choose you based on your talents and on your abilities, because if he did that, then it would be easy for you to say, well, man, no wonder God chose me because man, I'm just a, this is a, you know, a strength in my life. He will choose you to do something that's a weakness in your life. When we started our Bible college over in uh, Australia, we set it up, we sent a couple over there. They had already done all of the leg work. They had already gotten the facilities and everything. And then I came over and we were having a big conference and we were announcing the opening of the school in our office. And the very day of that conference, 
the guy who was going to start it came to me and he says, I can't do this. He says, man, this is just so big. This is, this is beyond me. I can't do it. And he says, please don't announce that we're going to open up this school. And I said, you know what? I love that attitude. And he just looked at me like, what are you saying? And I said, that's great for you to recognize that this is bigger than you. So you won't depend on yourself. If you don't stop there, if you will go beyond that and say, God, I can't, but here I am. And if you can use me, I'll, I'll serve you the best I can. I said, that's the kind of person I want. I don't want a person who is self-confident and is going to go out and serve God in their own strength and in their own power. And again, this is what so many Christians are doing. They are going out and they have a good desire. They want to do something good, but God, you just get me introduced. You put me on the stage and I can handle it from here. That's a recipe for disaster. And I can guarantee you, if you find what God called you to do, you are going to have a demonic attack against you. Satan is going to try and derail you because God's plans for you are awesome. They're good and it will change people's lives and you'll be a blessing. And Satan can see the, the uh, potential damage you could bring to his kingdom. So if you really find God's will, he's going to come against you. And if you are trying to fight him in your own strength and power, you're going to fail. Satan's been at this for thousands of years. He's smarter than you are. And you have to realize that you, you need to constantly be in a state of, oh God, I need you. God, this is bigger than I am. So I'm saying all of these things primarily to those of you who don't know for sure what God's purpose for your life is. You've got to recognize that you've got a God-given purpose that was given to you before you were ever born. It has nothing to do with your natural talents and abilities. Now, again, God might use those things, but I'm saying don't limit him to just what you've seen because I believe he could strengthen you as he has me in areas where I personally am weak and he has strengthened me in those areas. So you can't base it on your own experiences. You can't base it on your own natural talents. You got to recognize that God has a purpose for you that was written before you ever had developed any talents, before you had ever done anything. God has a purpose for your life and it's dependent upon you to find out what it is. Over in Ephesians chapter five, again, I'm quoting a lot of things just so I won't have to take the time to turn over there, but it says in Ephesians chapter five, don't be ignorant but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Man, I love the Bible, the way it says things. It just doesn't pull any punches. You're ignorant if you don't know what the will of the Lord is. Amen. That's not politically correct. Other people would say it nicer, but it just, I like the way, it, it, I don't have to guess what the Lord's saying. If you don't know what God's will is, you're ignorant. God loves you, ignorant. <laughs> I love you. I'm not against you, but did you know God wants you to know? That shows you that God wants you to know what his will for your life is more than you want to know it. You don't have to beg God and say, oh God, would you please show me? God's been trying to show you what he wants for your life. God has been trying to deal with you, but you have to open up. And again, I go back to Romans chapter 12, verse one, that you present your body a living sacrifice. That's God's will for you. If somehow or another you could stumble upon God's purpose, his will, his vision for your life, but you weren't yielded to him as a living sacrifice, you would mess the whole thing up. Even if you knew what God's perfect plan for your life is, you would mess the whole thing up if you aren't a living sacrifice. So that God's order is to become a living sacrifice first to give yourself to God and everything that you have. And if God gets your heart, if he gets everything that you have, I guarantee you, he will get your service and he will show you, he will start directing your life into the right path and he will bring things to pass. The Lord spoke this to me out of uh, Romans 12, one. He says, if you make yourself a living sacrifice, you would have to backslide on God. You would have to backslide on me. You would have to rebel at me to keep from fulfilling my will for your life. 
It's impossible to be a living sacrifice and just say, God, I don't have any plans. I don't have any goals. I'm not trying to get you to do something. I just want to know you and what do you want me to do? It's impossible to have that attitude and miss God's will for your life. It doesn't come sovereignly. Man, I could, I could spend two or three sessions ministering on this. I'm just going to say it in passing, but there's a lot of people that have this this thought that God just sovereignly moves your life and whatever happens, it must be God's will. All things work together for good. And man, I shouldn't have even quoted that scripture because I hadn't got time to explain it. But that is not saying that everything that happens in your life is from God. God is not the author of rape, murder, uh, all of the terrible things that happen. But God can take anything that the devil throws at you and work it together for good if you're interceding, if you love God, and if you're resisting the devil. I'm not going to spend any more time than that. But that is, there's some people that just think everything works together for good. Well, if you believe that, why are you even here? <laughs> Stay at home and do nothing. Que sera, sera. Whatever will be, will be. If you would look at your life, not everything in your, you know, not everything in your life is ordained of God. I can guarantee you there's people sitting right here that you've made some major mistakes and you've done some, uh, Brother Dwayne says, a piece of stupid. <laughs> and you have done some dumb things and you know it wasn't God. So if God didn't force you and control everything in your life, what makes you think he's going to control everything in everybody else's life? God does not control things. It doesn't come to pass automatically. So you need to, first of all, recognize that God has a plan for your life that may be completely disjointed, disconnected from what you think are your natural talents and abilities. It was written before you had ever done anything. It was while you were still in your mother's womb. He told you not to be ignorant, but understanding what his will is. The first step is to be a living sacrifice. And to just turn yourself over to God and say, God, here I am and I want you more than anything else. And if you do that, I guarantee you, he will reveal his will. It goes on to say in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, right after it talks about being a living sacrifice, which is just your reasonable service. Then verse 2 says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and the acceptable and the perfect will of God. And so it says you get transformed. The word for transform there is Greek word metamorpho. It's where we get the word metamorphosis from, describing a caterpillar spinning in a cocoon and coming out this beautiful butterfly. If you want to change from a caterpillar to a butterfly, it happens through the renewing of your mind. And then the results of that is that you will prove what is the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. Man, that's awesome. You can't miss it. You would have to backslide on God. So the very first step is to recognize that it's not up to you to pick and choose what you want to do and then ask God to bless it. You need to recognize God had a purpose for you while you were still in your mother's womb. God has written in a book everything that he wants your life to be. And then he commanded you not to be ignorant, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. The first step is to just say, here I am and I want your will. Even if it means me changing my vocation, if it means me changing everything about myself, everything's on the table. I've had some people before say, well, I'll serve God and do anything, but I don't want to go to Africa. I don't want to do that. You don't need to put, you don't need to put any reservations on it. Man, Carrie has a great illustration of this, and I probably won't get it word for word, but Carrie talked about that she had a piece of paper and wrote on it all of the things that she wanted in a husband, what she wanted her life to be and everything, and she had it all written down, and she signed it, and then kind of pushed it across the table to the Lord and said, would you sign this? And what he did was take a blank piece of paper, and he signed it, and then he told Carrie to sign it, and I'll fill it in. That's a better illustration. And yet many of us are saying, God, I'll do anything but this. See, that's not total surrender. That's not being a living sacrifice. You got to be willing to just make your life available to God. You know, my personal testimony is that I remember at five years old, I used to get out in the backyard at night and I would just lay there and look up at the stars and think about what is all of this about? 
What am I supposed to do? What's my life about? And I didn't have a lot of answers, but I knew as a five-year-old that God had some reason for me being here. Matter of fact, my mother actually got on my case and said, what are you doing out there in the backyard? And I had to start hiding to do it. But I remember just, I, I love to just sit there and think and dream about God, what's your purpose for my life? I knew that as a little tiny kid. God has a purpose for every single one of you. And yet the vast majority of us don't seek God's will. We just, you're kind of like a pinball where you just pull it back and you launch it. And then it goes and it just depends on what it hits and it just bounces around from thing to thing and you never know where it's going to go. And we just assume that, you know, this is the way things are going to be. When the Lord really revealed himself to me, I was in my first year of college just doing that because that's what you're supposed to do after high school. You go to college and, and I was just going to be a math major. I was going to be a teacher, a school teacher, because that's what everybody else in my family was. And I was just letting circumstances direct me. And you know, if the Lord hadn't have revealed himself and shown me things, I could have been all of those things and God could have blessed it and I could have touched some people but that's not what God's plans for my life were. And when I had this encounter with the Lord, the very first thing he told me was to get out of school. Now that's not for everybody, but for me, he told me to get out of school. He did not want me to go and just be a school teacher. And so he started directing my life immediately. He led me to do those things. Man, I wish I could talk to every one of you individually. I can't. So don't ask. <laughs> but if I was to sit down and just start asking you, do you know for sure that what you're doing is what God called you to do? Now, again, all of us are still growing. I'm not saying that any of us have arrived, but you ought to have at least left. You ought to know you're moving in that direction. And I would imagine that probably the majority of people in here don't know for sure that what you're doing is what God called you to do. And that's why you came here. And God loves you. And that's why he led you. That's why he inspired you to come here. But I'm just telling you that God's plans for you are better than your, your plans for yourself. Man, if they would have, you know, had a category for this in high school, least likely to succeed, I think I might have qualified. And... I'm not, you know, success is a relative term, but I, compared to what my plans for myself were, I guarantee you God has just done awesome things. It is phenomenal what God has done in my life. And I look back on my life and I'm just so blessed. I have people all the time say, would you go back and change anything? If you could go back 30 years, what would you do? I'd say, man, I wouldn't go back 30 years for nothing. <laughs> Because, man, I'm so blessed. I could have made a lot worse decisions than I did. It has turned out a lot better than it could have. Man, I just, I'm a blessed person. And if you don't look at your life that way and look and say that, man, I'm so blessed. If you don't get up in the morning excited about your life and thinking, God, this is awesome. You are so good. Then I doubt seriously that you have found God's will for your life. Because when you are in the center of God's will, there is a supernatural satisfaction and peace that goes with it that you don't get doing anything else. Some of you are praying for joy and peace and you would like to have more uh, satisfaction in your life. But part of the reason is because you aren't doing what God called you to do. And there is a holy dissatisfaction in your life. God doesn't want to just give you all of this hope and satisfaction because you'd be content where you are. Sometimes he stirs up the nest to make it so uncomfortable that you, you say there's got to be something more. Amen. It could be God that's giving you that dissatisfaction. Now, God's not the one that causes depression and things like that, but I, do, I can tell you that God, there's been many times that he has just changed my heart and that my dissatisfaction has shown me that I needed to go in a different direction. I remember when Jamie and I were in Seagaville, Texas, and uh, I went back there a few years ago, and I guarantee you, Seagaville, Texas is one of the most ugly places on the planet. And yet when I went there, I loved it. 
I was just so excited about Seagaville. I had other people tell me, why don't you get out of here? And I just loved it because that's where God told me to be. And then one day I was down at the church praying and I looked out the window and it's like everything went from color to black and white. And I looked and I said, boy, this place is bad. And I lost my love for that. And I mean, it was so obvious that my heart just made a 180 degree turn that I began to say, God, what's happening? And I spent about two hours praying. And over that period of time, the Lord told me your time here is over. It's time for you to leave. And so I started praying about well, when do I leave and where do I go? And he said, you'll be leaving November the 1st. And so I went home to tell Jamie, how was I going to tell Jamie that the Lord told me we'd been there for two years and man, I was committed to being there forever if that's what it took. And how was I going to tell Jamie that we were going to be moving? And when I got home, there was a for sale sign in our yard. And I went in and asked Jamie, I said, what is this? And she says, the landlady came over and said, we've got to be out of here on November the 1st. And so that was a confirmation. And I said, well, God told me that. And see the way he did that, he didn't say leave Seagaville. He didn't say that, but what he did, he just changed my heart. Psalms chapter 37, verse four says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. I don't believe that that's saying he's just gonna give you anything that you want because you might want some things that aren't good. But that's saying that when you truly put God first and delight in him, he will put his desires in your heart. And that's what happened to me. When I was supposed to be in Seagaville, I had a desire for it. And then after two years, he just changed that. And I could tell you that's how I went on television. That's how I started the Bible school. That's how I do so many things is through uh, listening to the Lord and just following the desires of my heart. But when you delight yourself in the Lord, there is a supernatural satisfaction that goes when you're in the center of the will, God's will that you don't have when you're out of God's will. It doesn't mean that you're a bad person. It doesn't mean you're rebelling at God. If you are rebelling at God, you aren't going to have satisfaction and peace. God's not going to bear witness to that. But you don't have to be in total sin and rebellion not to have that satisfaction. You just get out of the center of what God calls you to do. And there's not going to be the same anointing. There's not going to be the same freedom, the same peace, the same rest that goes with it. Some of you might have heard me give this story, but I was in um, Charlotte, North Carolina, and one of my partners always invited me to come minister to his staff. He had about 30 staff, and he told them the clock is running. You listen to this guy talk as long as he wants to, and I just would minister to him. And then I'd go into the break room, and they'd come back, and we saw people born again and healed and baptized, and the Holy Spirit saw great things happen. And I did that probably for 10 or 15 years. And one year when I came out, there was a woman sitting at a reception desk who wasn't back there with the rest of the people. And uh, so I just asked her, I said, so who are you? And she told me her name and she said, who are you? And I told her my name and uh, I said, why weren't you back there? And she says, oh, I'm the new kid. I'm the receptionist. And they kept me here answering the phones while everybody was in the back. She says, what do you do? And I said, I'm a minister. And her eyes got really big and she says, for who? And I said, for the Lord Jesus Christ. And she says, you're the one. And I said, the one what? And she, it turns out she was an Oriental lady and she, had, she was a Buddhist and she'd been going through all of her rituals. I don't know exactly what they were, but she just, right in the midst of going through her rituals the night before, she just told the Lord, she says, I know that there is a God. I know that you're real, but this can't be it. And she says, who are you? I want to know you. And she said that this ball of light came in front of her and she heard a voice saying, tomorrow I'll send you a man who will tell you where, who I am. And she says, you must be the man. And I said, I am the man. Amen. <laughs> and I got to lead this woman to the Lord and she got baptized in the Holy Spirit. I tell you, it was awesome. And when I went out and sat in my car, I couldn't even start the car. I was just so excited. I was so blessed thinking, man, I was in the right place at the right time. And there was such a sense of satisfaction and peace that goes with that that you don't get when you're doing your own thing. So I'm saying that there are some of you that have a holy dissatisfaction. It's God stirring you up to let you know that he's got something more. 
And I believe that that's why he's brought you here. And praise God, I believe that this week between Dwayne and me and the Holy Spirit speaking through us that God is going to plant things in your heart. He wants to reveal himself and his will to you more than you want to know it. And I believe that people are going to receive direction. Those of you that maybe already have direction are going to get some wisdom about how do you fulfill and follow what God has told you to do. But I believe that this is going to be a life-changing experience. And I know that because I, I know that God loves you and wants to use you more than you want to be used. Did you know, as a matter of fact, one of the reasons that you may not have seen God open up the doors, even if you know what God called you to do and you're frustrated because you know where you're supposed to go and it just seems like you are frustrated in getting there. One of the reasons that happens is because God loves you so much, he doesn't want to throw you out there and expose you to Satan and all of the things that are going to come against you if you aren't a living sacrifice and if you aren't yielded to him. He loves you more than he loves what you can do for him. Amen. He doesn't want to just use you up. Amen. He loves you. Yes. He wants you. And so the order for God is first of all to become a living sacrifice. And that way when God works on you and and makes you the person that you're supposed to be, then he'll be able to reveal himself in you and he'll be able to accomplish things. Back in the very beginning, when I knew that I was called to the ministry and I didn't know very many details, but I knew that he wanted me to minister to people all over the world. I knew that. But man, it was frustrating. I'd say it was... Well, it was 1968 when he touched me and revealed that to me. And, it, and he told me that when I started on television in 2000, that I was just starting my ministry. So that's 32 years that I went through a lot of frustration. And it seemed like I couldn't get there. And in the very beginning, especially, I just would spend lots of time saying, oh, God, use me. Oh, God, use me. And I'd plead with God. And finally, God spoke to me one day and he says, the reason I don't use you is because you aren't usable. He says, quit praying, God, use me and start praying, God, make me usable. And he says, when you get usable, I'll use you. God's not going to build a ship and leave it in dry dock. He builds a ship to put it out to sea. He's not going to do his work in you so that you can just sit there and do nothing. He has a purpose for every single person's life. And if you'll yield to him, he'll do it. You know, Billy Epperhart down here is our CEO and he pastored three churches, if I'm not mistaken. One of them got up to, I think, 800 people and Billy was in ministry and successful in seeing things happen. But then God just told him to leave the ministry and get into business. <laughs> and some of his friends kind of criticized him like, are you still serving God? Have you... Walked away from it. But did you know in hindsight, we've talked about this, all of the things that he learned in business, all of the lawsuits that came against him, man, I've been using them. Everything that happened to him, God led him in those things. And he has said himself that all of those things were per to prepare him for what he's doing right now. I interviewed John Reich, who's our builder, and he was sharing the same things when we did an inside story and talking about he felt like everything was leading up to this point. Our architect, uh, Seth Emerson and, and John, they were telling us the exact same thing, that everything that they've done, believe, is leading up to this. And we could just go through person after person after person that it may not look like all of these things were ordained by God, but God was leading and God can take all of these things and he can begin to use it, but you've got to find out what his purpose for your life is. It's not going to happen accidentally. Amen? Amen? So let me ask this. If you, again, nobody has reached the zenith of everything. Nobody is doing everything perfectly. So I'm not saying that you've got it all together. But if you, if you know the direction God wants you to go and you just need some help getting there, I'm not asking you to respond to this, but I'm asking those who honestly do not know the purpose that you were created for. You fall into that category of the people that I was talking about that you, you want your life to count, you want to serve God, but you don't know. 
You're just kind of hoping that everything's working out. You're trusting that God just sovereignly is going to do things, but you, you couldn't tell me what his real purpose for your life is. You've never had God speak to you. You might even be doing what God wants you to do, but you don't have an assurance that it's what God called you to do. So if that's you, I want to just pray for you and, and uh, pray that God is going to reveal himself to you again, believing that he wants you to know his will for your life more than you want to know it. So if that's you, would you just be humble enough to just stand where you are and I'm going to pray for you and we're going to start this conference by just opening ourselves up and asking God to reveal to each one of us what his purpose is. And again, I could go into a lot more detail. That book on how to find, follow, and fulfill God's will will go into a lot more detail than what I've done tonight. But the first step is just to be a living sacrifice. And so the first thing I'm going to lead you in is just a prayer of saying, God, I want to know your will. Here I am and everything is on the table. I'm giving you a blank sheet of paper with my name on it. And I'm asking you to fill in all of the details. Are you willing to do that? Amen. Amen. And it'll be better than you think. It'll be awesome. So Father, I thank you for all of these people. Father, thank you for bringing them here. I believe that you orchestrated this, that you're the one that put this on their heart. I thank you that you drew them here. I thank you that you led me to say what I'm saying. I believe that the Holy Spirit takes these words and just impresses on every single person that we have a God-ordained purpose for our life that was written before we were ever born. And so, Father, we yield to that right now. We, we lay everything on the table and we say, here's our life. We become a living sacrifice. And we ask you to just consume this sacrifice. We want you to take control of our life. And Father, not only for the vocation, the direction of our life, but just everything in our life, any of our habits, any of our thoughts, our personality quirks and things that haven't been yielded to you, we just lay ourselves before you. And Father, we ask you to consume these sacrifices, to come and reveal yourself. And then as we renew our mind, we believe you are going to prove, make manifest to our physical senses what the good the acceptable and the perfect will of God is. Father, we thank you for that. And I believe that right now we have made that commitment and Father, we believe it's coming to pass. We thank you in advance, Father. And I believe that right now you are beginning a supernatural work in every person's heart who is standing here. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. The Lord is speaking to somebody here who you, you may not have stood, but there's somebody here who you believe you know what God's will is, but you've messed up so badly that you think God can't use you. Romans eleven twenty nine 29 says, the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. God's purpose for your life has not changed. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how badly you've messed it up. God is at least as good as a GPS system that can recalculate if you make a wrong turn and get you back on track. Praise God. Here's somebody, who is this? I, who's this that you know God has a purpose for your life, but you feel like you've messed up so bad that you just uh, aren't sure God will use you? Here's a person, but you know, I'd like to ask our prayer ministers, if you would, to come down here and I'm gonna ask any person who that's a word for you. I want you to come down here and just acknowledge it and, and humble yourself and say, that's me. And we're gonna pray with you and I believe that God is gonna make a difference in your life. There could be more than one person. Let's everybody stand up. So if that's you and if you feel like you just messed things up and you are doubting that God could ever use you, that was a word from God for you. You need to come forward and you need to let someone pray with you right now. Praise God. Amen. So if you need prayer, come down here. We've got people that'll point you to someone and these people will be praying with you. Thank you, Jesus. 
Father, we just agree and we receive this tonight. Thank you, Father. You know, right now, the Lord is speaking to some people. If you, if you just were to remove all of your self-imposed restrictions, maybe you don't feel qualified. You don't have the money. You don't have the natural talents and abilities uh, and just on and on it goes. But if you were to just remove all of these reasons that you have not to do something, what is it that you want to do? If you are delighting yourself in the Lord, Psalms 37, four says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. If you are truly delighting in the Lord, well, then I believe that many of those desires are God given desires. What is it that you would do if you, if you didn't have restrictions on you, if you didn't have financial things, if you didn't have a career that you feel like you're tied into? There's some of you right now that if you would be honest, there's desires that if you would follow them, I believe that that could be God. You know, I had a Bible college student come to me at the end of the second year. And she says, I just don't know what God wants me to do. I came to Bible college wanting to find out and I just have no idea what God wants me to do. And so I just started asking her questions. And this was a person who was seeking God and who had put God first. And so my first question was, I said, do you see yourself uh, as a minister? And she said, yes. And I said, what kind of minister? Do you see yourself behind a pulpit like pastor in a church or preaching? And she says, no, not that kind of minister. And I said, well, what kind of minister? She says, children. I love children. I want to minister to children. And I said, do you see yourself ministering in the States or overseas? And she says, I've always had dreams about me ministering and there's just a whole sea of black faces. So I assume that it's Africa. And I started asking her different questions and by 10 minutes into it, she knew that she was supposed to run an orphanage in an exact country. And she had so much direction, but she had just been dismissing it all and thinking that how, how do I know if it's God? She had a lot of direction. There are some people in here that you have more direction than what you've been following. You're afraid. You're waiting on an audible voice. You're waiting on a bolt of lightning. That's not how it comes. We'll be talking about this more. I'm sure Dwayne will deal with this. I'll deal with this more. But you just need to, right now, you've prayed and you've asked God to speak to you and you need to open up your heart and quit limiting what God can do with you and open up to whatever. Man, God could do things with you that are way, way, way beyond you. Praise God. Man, God's already done things in my life that I guarantee you are way, way, way beyond my natural ability and stuff. And so God can do the same with you. I tell you, if you receive this tonight and if there's this many people that responded there, this could cause a worldwide revival. If every person here just started living up to your potential. It's a process. It's not going to happen instantly, but you will prove the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. Amen? Praise God. So we've still got some people waiting, and uh, we'll be down here as long as it takes to pray with you. Father, we just thank you tonight for the Word of God. Thank you for these scriptures. Thank you that you love us so much that while we were still in our mother's womb, you already had possessed us. You had already written in your book every day of our life. And so we just thank you that you're revealing that to us. Thank you, Father, that seeds have been sown tonight. As we go to bed tonight, I pray that when we come back tomorrow, that, Father, you are just going to further reveal things to us and that, Father, people will leave here knowing that you have a purpose and knowing the direction to go. So, Father, we thank you for that. We agree and we receive it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God.